today we are gathered here um, for the fifth Omidyar lecture. Uh, and the series is called Land, Housing and Property Rights, Tracing Policy Shifts and Emerging Issues in India and Global South. Uh, today's lecture is on a case for land rights, the experience of small towns in Gujarat. And uh, it's part of the larger series of our Omidyar lectures uh, where we are uh, looking at um, where the Center for Urban Policy and Governance at TIS uh, in Mumbai and the Omidya Network uh, of India has come together collaboratively to um, showcase uh, and sort of forefront, uh, create an interdisciplinary dialogue amongst academics, uh, scholars, practitioners and activists and policymakers with a focus on contemporary developments related to and ongoing experiments in making land and housing more accessible as well as more inclusive. So therefore, uh, through our lectures and uh, webinars, we've been trying to look at uh, themes which are related to land rights, especially for marginalized urban groups, um, the issues and challenges that uh, real estateization throws up, as well as trying to look at commons as a way of contesting uh, the commodification of land, uh, particularly with the focus on uh, what's happening as alternative ways to sort of frame uh, the issue of land and land rights in the global south. Uh, so for today with us, we have our speaker uh, Aditya, Aditya from, uh, uh, from Hunarshala, and uh, he's going to be talking about his experiences uh, from uh, Gujarat and uh, from the small in, uh, towns in Gujarat where he's been working. Aditya is an architect. He's also a development professional and he has a very deep attachment and affection uh, for the environment as well as equity concerns. Uh, he's an accredited green building professional and has a master's degree in sustainable development and climate change. He has an experience of more than 10 years, mostly with appropriate construction technologies and inclusive planning of the built habitat. Uh, for the last seven years, he has been involved with the Puna Shala Foundation based out of Buj, where he's worked extensively on housing for the urban uh, low income groups, as well as appropriating appropriate housing systems for the rural communities. Additionally, Aditya has also been involved with various studies and documentation exercises of urban public spaces. Um, and this is under the larger agenda of the right to the city. He has a strong belief in traditional knowledge systems, participatory processes and commons. So we welcome you all to Aditya's talk and uh, the discussant for today is uh, Dunu, Dunu Roy who has uh, almost 75, uh, who's uh, of more than 75 years of age, he says in his CV, but he has a wealth of experience, particularly with looking at uh, rights, rights to the city, but particularly of uh, the working class. And uh, uh, though he has a background in engineering, he brings with him a wealth of experience in uh, organizing, mobilizing different groups uh, in cities and in urban issues. And of late, he's also been interested in looking at uh, issues around the urban environment, climate change and sustainability concerns. So we welcome you both uh, to the talk. And uh, we are now requesting um, Aditya to sort of start with uh, his presentation uh, for, and the presentation will be around about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, which will then be followed by uh, Dunu as discussant. Yeah, thank you, Ratula. So I'm going to share my screen and straight away jump into my presentation. Okay. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a study that we did uh, between 2016 and 2018 uh, under a, a program called Housing for All Plan of Action, 
uh, and we studied about eight cities uh, around Gujarat. Most of these cities were small towns uh, of uh, uh, class D towns. So population was about 50,000. We also studied a few uh, one, uh, towns which had population of say one and a half uh, lakh to two lakh. And uh, I will try to touch upon two factions or two threads of this work that we did. Uh, one is the... Uh, uh, yeah, so one is uh, about uh, uh, how the government saw this and why government wanted yeah. to do it at the first place. And the second one were, uh, is uh, what we actually saw on the ground and, uh, in these uh, small towns. Mm -hmm. So at Purashala, we have always been more interested in smaller cities, uh, rural areas. So it kind of fell in our uh, agenda. The pictures that you see now on my screen are all, all the people that we talk to in the, all these eight state cities, uh, different communities. Uh, okay. And this uh, study uh, was done uh, uh, through two or three different organizations. Uh, there was people in center from Ahmedabad involved in a few cities. There was the studio from Moroville. Involved. There were several local organizations who, who were uh, helping us. Uh, we also had uh, an urban panel from Mumbai, uh, Malini uh, Krishna Kuti, who had, uh, was mentoring us. Uh, and through that, we uh, did the study. Uh, so before I go to what the study was, we had already started working on housing long before this work uh, through something called Slum Kuti, uh, Slum Free City Plan of Action which we prepared when uh, at that point of time, Rajiv Awas Yojana was going on. Uh, and we prepared this for Kuch. Uh, and I'll quickly give a glimpse of what was the situation at that time for Kuch. And then, uh, then I'll go and talk about uh, one other city, uh, Rapa, uh, and, and uh, share what we learned from these cities. So for SFCQA, we did a citywide survey of all the informal settlements in the city. And we found out that at least one third of the population stay in, in uh, settlements that can be classified as informal settlements. Uh, there were 74 pockets uh, at that time. And when we surveyed again in 2000, this survey, this work was done in 2013, 14. And when we surveyed again in 2016 and 17, there were 77 uh, uh, pockets and the population had gone up from say 12 and a half thousand to 13,000 households to 14,000 households. Uh, these informal uh, settlements occupied about 6% of the city. Uh, and uh, after preparation of the slum free city uh, plan of action, we went ahead and uh, decided to implement uh, uh, whatever we uh, recommended in this SF SFCQA and chose three pockets. So I won't go uh, deep in what we did in SFCPO, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about the pilots that we did and how we understood land through uh, doing these pilots. And then I'll talk about the HFA POA that we did again later on, which was online with SFC POA, but I'll also talk about the differences between these two. So this is the map of Burj. All the yellow patches that you see are all informal settlements that we had mapped. And the red ones are the ones that we picked up as the first few, three settlements that we wanted to work with. There were several indicators that were considered. For example, readiness of the community to uh, go ahead, uh, availability of uh, or clearance of land and so on, or the requirement or, or the urgency of requirement of housing in these settlements. Uh, I'll talk about one of the uh, pockets, which is Ramdev Nagar. Uh, this, you see uh, the top satellite image is how it was. And this is basically how uh, the informal settlements are in smaller towns in Gujarat. Uh, quite scattered, not as dense as you would find in uh, more urbanized areas, uh, larger land holdings. Uh, and also, uh, uh, a lot of these, uh, uh, the so-called informal settlements were at one point of time, just an offshoot settlement that uh, in princely towns, the kings had established. And now that the cities had expanded, these settlements came inside these uh, towns. And then because of lack of infrastructure, they tend to uh, then fall under this definition of slums. The bottom uh, uh, satellite images were uh, after the development of this pocket. So you'll see a more row housing kind of thing happening. 
uh, this is just a quick site layout that was done. Uh, uh, and the story is that uh, it was very difficult to convince the community uh, to go for this program because there was a lot of misinformation where uh, they thought that we'll take away the land and build commercial complexes and then won't give them houses and so on. So a lot of, I think at least two to three years, a lot of social mobilization happened on this settlement. Uh, and I think uh, at the, uh, unlike the MAYE, which we have now, RAY mandated uh, a more detailed social audit. So we were following those guidelines also. Uh, so this was the uh, segment. And what was the turning point was that the families were told that uh, were to be given 65 square meters of land on lease uh, for 99 years. And this is what turned them around. Uh, because it was also a challenge to explain them why this will be uh, more useful because many of these families had larger land holding than 65 square meters. So some had 110, some had 150 and so on. Uh, but they also re uh, got ready simply because they, uh, they understood the fact that once they get the 65 square meters on their land, the documents are going to be very valuable for them and the future generation uh, of the family. Uh, these were the structures that were built on this land. Uh, this is one type, and it was all community-led. So people decided where the walls would be, what the house uh, rooms would be looking like. The top floor was not as per the government scheme, but uh, we knew that a future requirement for housing stock will come in. So we had designed it such that uh, at least two more floors would be added. And right now, when we go to the site now, it has been about four to five years. We see many of these families have already built this top floor, and uh, their children are staying in this. Uh, there was also a very strong community-led approach uh, where once people knew that they are going to get ownership of the land, they started investing in this, their own money. And they started building things that uh, uh, were not really uh, under the schemes purview. So for example, staircases on top, underground water tanks, and so on. But the other concept that we introduce uh, around land ownership is that uh, the land even though one family would get, say, one parcel of land, there was a possibility of land pooling uh, for relatives. So many of these families chose to do that. So this model that you're seeing on the screen is basically two families, but they have different patterns. One has a room in front, the other one doesn't have. So they were basically land pooling this. And the boundary wall in between these two plots could also be removed, giving a larger uh, common space. And now we see that there are at least three layers of uh, spaces in common areas that families have done. One is the most common one where people come, park vehicles, uh, uh, and so on. The other one is the second layer where families, uh, relatives share that space. Uh, and third one is a more uh, intimate uh, space. So th that kind of uh, hierarchy in spaces happen, and which happened because the family uh, knew or uh, understood that they could pull this land. several and these are pictures of the community processes that we did uh, we had to lay out the houses in one show it to them show the 3d views and more than community we had to do a lot of uh, advocacy with government agencies trying to tell them why it is important for us to transfer land uh, why is it important for people to build themselves and so on and what what then exactly will be our role in this whole process we also did a lot of uh, uh, technical trainings for the homeowners because many of these homeowners were themselves uh, 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 construction workers and uh, they chose what to build what not to build and so on and we facilitated that and these are the this is the picture of completed houses you can see that the front house doesn't have a boundary wall in between so this large space basically belongs to technically two families but because we know how the social capital works in these informal sectors, uh, they have pulled this. These are more pictures. So what the basic idea again about, of how we planned this was, I'll just give an example of how we arranged the land. So instead of, at that point of time, what we thought that instead of giving the parcel of land which they are holding right now, without rearranging might create a, a, a bit of a problem in laying out infrastructure or also and also because it would not create a, a, a more equitable distribution of land. So this is an existing uh, informal settlement. 
and we did we experimented with different forms of housing layout which was informed by their cultural preferences uh, and also the livelihood activities that they do some would need a larger front open space some would need bathroom at the back and so on and using three models we arranged the uh, this uh, the land uh, distribution on these side and we found that, and this is an example of a typical informal settlement in small, smaller towns, that at least one third uh, to one fourth of the land is actually better for infrastructure, for other activities, for future housing stock. And this is not, uh, uh, and what we are doing is not just erasing what was there and building something new, but uh, Three maps on top. The left one is what it generally is in, in informal settlements. The middle one is how one would approach if they really, you know, uh, just raise everything and build everything in row. And what we generally did was the third one, where we uh, considered the existing houses which could be retained or improved, and their existing community infrastructure, and then planned around that. And we realized that even after doing that, we still have uh, very comfortable uh, land areas in these cities. And the, we did similar exercise, not just at one pocket, but uh, throughout the city. So in this map, you'll see that uh, there are two untenable slums marked as red, where uh, it wasn't possible to for in situ developers. Uh, one was in a forest uh, area uh, under forest department, and the other one was uh, a river uh, uh, water stream. Uh, other than that, we we found out that most of the settlements in which were tenable, they could be built in situ, partially or fully. So we studied uh, the densities. In this map, you'll see all the red pockets had densities which were higher than uh, what would be required for a G ground floor or G plus one uh, uh, arrangement. And the light green is where the land is getting freed what I explained earlier. So there's some land which is getting freed after regulation of the sense. And a few of them were orange ones, which basically are the ones where the density is correct for the kind of development that will be acceptable for people. Uh, and there's enough land area. We further divide, subdivided these pockets because we also knew that just a theoretical exercise might not help. We also need to look at the quality of land that is there. So we divided where is it where uh, that we are getting say half hectare to two hectare land. Where is it that we are getting more than five hectare of land? And similarly, we proposed to the city that, uh, see, these are the four or five pockets where if you regularize, give people land and uh, uh, infrastructure, you might benefit because the, uh, the ULB will get hold of several land pockets, which they can use for future housing store, different uh, other infrastructure facilities and so on. And uh, about 81 hectare was the number that we got. And that's when the HFAPUA work began coming in. And as all of us, uh, most of us would know, there were four verticals. One was looking at slum and the other three was uh, non-slum, uh, the other urban poor. Uh, and this was the difference that came in after Arirang. Of course, now I think, uh, now we have uh, cross vertical uh, uh, projects also coming in. And this slide, I just want to explain what government wanted us to do when they impaneled us. Uh, this might not be readable, so I'll just explain that. They were looking at slum uh, households and other urban poor as two different uh, wings of demand. Uh, they wanted us to follow the SFCA, SFCPOA model, but in a diluted manner for all the informal settlements. And for other urban poor, they wanted us to do a demand survey, which was not door to door, but to set up, say, camps uh, and ask people who wanted house, declare their incomes, and so on. Uh, based on this, we were supposed to prepare a housing for all plan of action, where we would uh, basically be telling that, okay, this city has a, a slum housing demand of this, these many houses and other urban poor housing demand of these many houses. You will require this much money for this, and uh, uh, this is how every year you should implement. So, say 100 houses this year, 2,000 houses next year, and so on, so that the ULB and the state government be, can be informed with the financial uh, requirement of this. Uh, we then went back to them, and under this, we got these eight cities around Gujarat, 
uh, there was Bhuj, Bachao in Rapper in Kutch. There was Mansa, Degam, Chaklasi around Ahmedabad area. In Saurashtra, we had these two, Jamjopur and Kambalya. And we had uh, specifically respect, uh, requested the government to give us these smaller cities so that we can uh, apply our learnings from Bhuj in these cities. But we also explained it to them that simply looking at financial viability is not going to help. Uh, and uh, we also then asked, uh, did something called curative strategy and preventive strategy. This was also taken from uh, the SFCP work, where we not only considered what is now, but also what will be. And uh, not just financial, but also land requirement for this, because we were strongly going to advocate uh, transfer of land uh, as one of the uh, solutions. Uh, then we went to uh, these pockets. This is a picture where we, we are doing a household survey. We set up camps for people to come and fill forms. We also did several workshops with counselors and the ULB officers to explain what we are doing, why we are doing it, uh, and also took their recommendation. Because whenever we went to a new city, the first task was always to identify which are the settlements which would come or uh, under the definition of slums. So I'll just now jump to Rapper, which is one of the uh, eastern districts in Kutch, which is which you can see in this map. Uh, this is a development plan of the same town. Uh, and interestingly, uh, except for Kutch, uh, uh, I think very few other cities had development plans. Kutch, most of the towns in Kutch have a development plan because in 2001, after, post, after the earthquake of 2001, uh, several area development authorities were set up for post earthquake rehabilitation. And so these cities had development plan. And Rapper had a core city, which was uh, the old city, and we had residential and farming areas around it. Uh, there were about 18 slums that were identified. And this is a map of that, uh, 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 the slum distribution. And there was another interesting thing that we noticed is that councillors and the ULB insisted on taking a few, uh, many of these settlements which are actually outside the city boundary. So uh, in the slide, if you can see, uh, there's this red boundary that demarcates the town limit. And there are a few pockets that are on the highway, on the outsides, so like Lal Sari, Halipad, and so on. And uh, they asked us to take it because they said that they anticipate the expansion of the city boundary along this uh, transport uh, connection. And so we should consider that because in future we'll have to develop. So we did that. We defined the slum settlements as uh, uh, outer fringe where these pockets came in, the town and the core fringe and, and the pockets that were right at the old city uh, settlement as core uh, slums. This was important because this was also uh, defining the land prices. <laughs> Uh, density is naturally the core uh, slum pockets had higher densities. Uh, also, whether these were pub, uh, on public land or private land, actually majority of this land was public land. Uh, the caste and uh, religion distribution, uh, core city were, had a good number of Muslim population, while the others had mostly OBC and SUST communities. Uh, whether they had a semi uh, pakka house, pakka house, or pacha house. And it, this is another trend where in smaller cities it differs a little bit from larger cities, is that uh, we, we will generally find more semi pakka uh, houses instead of uh, completely pacha houses. These are uh, pictures of, the, uh, of one of, of a few slum pockets. You can see how the houses are not as small as one would imagine. Uh, and uh, the major problem in these pockets were not not dwelling, but access to say water or uh, this uh, upper was actually uh, declared as uh, ODF open defecation free, but we saw like the bottom center picture you'll see a toilet built with a pipe on the road. So this was a, a standard detail in all these uh, pockets. Uh, then we further did analysis based on uh, HFPUA use, which asked us to use land as the uh, resource uh, for private developers to come in and uh, whatever profits they might make by utilizing this land, they should invest it in, in development of these informal settlements. Uh, tenability analysis, uh, and only one uh, slum in Rapper came under untenable category because 
it was right on the river and uh, it would get flooded every monsoon so uh, it, and even the the household and families there said that they would like to move to a better place and this is basically sarbangi that i'm talking about in the left map you see it's right at the river and uh, uh, in the satellite image you'll see that part of it is actually uh, you know, on the river uh, this is picture of that same settlement and these are the kind of houses we saw there the other interesting thing that happened here was uh, there were many settlements which were on hill tops or so called ridges uh, so this is peerthar and the other this what this uh, posed as a challenge was infrastructure costs would go up because now you have you don't have water pressures that will give you uh, water on this uh, higher areas and and also uh, because it's hilly so construction costs might go up and so on so we considered that we put that in our recommendation uh, this is a picture of the same uh, pocket and we looked at because the advantage that these small cities gave us that is that we had limited number of uh, informal settlements and which uh, gave us the flexibility of going in detail of each of the settlements making their profiles and uh, proposing strategies which are more uh, uh, tailor made to these settlements uh, this is just a summary table of all the slums and how many were tenable how many were untenable most of it was semi tenable simply because they fell either under different land use or on hill tops uh, and such uh, and then we started developing the uh, uh, development uh, developing the slum settlements based on what is the footprint that will be required for these families what is the carpet area and uh, land footprint and so on and again did the same exercise that we did in proch and we realized that there's at least 96 hectares of land that is available however we also planned the relocation of a few settlements where people actually wanted to like uh, sarvangi wanted to go somewhere else so for that we did a, a proximity analysis of whether there's other land pocket that is available in, in proximity we took a radius of 800 meters for this uh, and there's another condition uh, uh, consideration that we had to take was that when we are relocating the communities need to be matching because if we uh, because if for example if a, there's a devi puja community that community will probably not live with uh, say a, a junni uh, sikh community because they perform animal sacrifices as rituals or uh, they would also not like to live with bheels or uh, other such uh, uh, castes so uh, we had to consider that and that's what came on uh, uh, after a study and we decided, we put that in our recommendations as well though hfpua didn't necessarily require us to consider caste as one of the or community structures as one of the uh, indicators for this uh and after doing that we still in rapper at about 74 hectares of land which was actually getting freed after organization of these slum pockets and we were actually using this as a case for to uh, for the government to start allocating land to these families to uh, to, to uh, sell our point that why even after you uh, give land to these houses you still have land it's not like you are going to lose land in fact it is going to unlock a lot of land parcels that you don't have access to it uh this is priority analysis basically which uh, pocket should be developed first and this we did because we have to prepare annual implementation plans uh, so which slum should come first which should come after that and so on and there was another analysis that the government had asked us to do which was financial analysis and the hfp poa that government wanted us to do was essentially a financial viability plan they just wanted to understand whether it is financially viable for them to develop all the uh, informal settlements through a private developer led uh, initiative and in all these small towns uh, none of the slum pockets uh, showed any viability all of them were unviable simply because uh, first of all the land prices were not as high as bigger cities so even if a developer comes in and puts money that person will not be making profit so like this table here we use the same structure that the government had uh, uh, suggested us to use and the profit margin was 6% for a developer uh, which the government had said that should be at least 30 to 40% for you to make it viable 
Uh, and this was even after the FSI was increased to 1.8 instead of 1.2, which was which is actually there. Uh, and this was the case throughout all the cities except one where uh, the land prices were a little high. Uh, we then also did non-slum demands. I'll go. I won't go in detail of this, but we did a, a ward-wise non-slum uh, urban poor demand and tried to match it with the. Uh, the land availability that will happen uh, after the regulation of uh, uh, slums. Uh, this flowchart uh, uh, quickly says what we had actually proposed. So uh, on the left bar, you'll see the city land, about five to six percent of the city land is under the informal settle uh, uh, settlements. And once we redevelop that, give all the families land holdings, uh, we will have compact and organized slum with good infrastructure, but we still have about 20% uh, to 25% land, which we free, which can be used for uh, infrastructure, commercial, like livelihood, and you will still have some developable, developable land, which the ULB can use for further developing affordable housing or keeping it safe as land pool for future development. And this was, this was actually possible. Uh, and this was possible without uh, a developer-led uh, initiative which was actually showing a, a negative premium. Uh, yeah. So some more pictures of uh, another city, Bachao, similar uh, situation. Uh, this is, and this was, this I'm showing simply because there was something different in this one. Uh, this is the spread of the slum settlements around the city. You'll see two transport nodes parallel to each other. Uh, and, what was remarkable was there was a good number of rental households in, in these slum pockets, which uh, even after which uh, said that they would not want ownership of land there. And many of these were also uh, basically those uh, families who had gone to say uh, a slum lord basically who had larger uh, land holding in the slum informally within the slum itself and had built several houses and who he, he was uh, informally renting it out. So these were the, uh, other than such small differences, most of these towns were similar in the fact that land could be allocated to the families and still it could be a gain for the jewel. Let's skip this. And current situation then, basically now this was uh, in 2020, we filed an RTI to ask what is the situation? And here you'll see in the left pie chart at the bottom, uh, uh, the center, there's hardly any uh, achievement that they are showing in the PMAY urban, which has happened under ISSR, which is NC2 slum reallocation. Most of it is uh, BLC, which is basically for families who already own land. Or uh, uh, at the bottom, you'll see in CLSS, major uh, a very significant part of it is going to MIG, where loan is being given to people, families who are earning 12 lakh per annum. Uh, so that's where a lot of these PMYU success stories and numbers are coming from, not uh, the, the slum pockets. And in most of the cities that we work, uh, I think none, not even a single house has been built under this. And this was simply something that we had already told the government that is not going to happen under ISSR unless you start giving land to these families and start transferring them to beneficiary land, uh, uh, which has not happened, uh, at least in, in these small towns. Uh, yeah, so I think I can end here. Yeah. Thank you, Aditya. That was a really packed presentation. Um, yeah. Yes, and I think it uh, sort of throws up an, an interesting case uh, because we sort of began this set of lectures with uh, the Jaga project in Orisha um, and, you know, the land titling that's going on there with, within a particular, you know, the, the act and how that has sort of panned out in terms of land rights and um, housing provisioning for the urban poor. Um, so I'm now going to ask uh, Dunu to come in and uh, uh, discuss the points uh, raised by uh, Aditya in this presentation. Thank you, Ratula. Can you hear me? Yes, 
your difference. Okay. I'm sorry, I missed a bit because suddenly the power disappeared here and I was literally left in the dark. Uh, no, I'm it's unbelievable. You are powerless. <laughs> yeah, and I'm in the dark too. Okay. So, so that's why I'm not switching on my video. Okay. Because okay. you won't be able to see much. Sure. Um, so I also missed a bit of the initial presentation. Uh, but uh, thank you, Aditya. I think that was a excellent presentation and obviously something that is expected of Hunar Shala. Uh, Hunar Shala has many, many years of experience in doing this kind of thing and the painstaking work that goes into doing these kind of designs, planning, bringing communities into the fold is so obvious from what you've put forward. Uh, I have only, I think, maybe three or four, yeah, four points that I would like to highlight. And uh, those three or four points are, it's not that I'm saying that there are answers for them and uh, Aditya or anybody else would have immediate answers, but those four points are something that uh, you probably need further reflection and further discussion. So essentially I'm trying to provoke some kind of uh, more thinking on this issue. Uh, the first point is what exactly does participation mean? Uh, community participation. Is community participation restricted to making choice, making a choice between options that are presented uh, before them, or does it also mean enlarging the options? Uh, I mean, there are, you know, things like uh, PMAY, housing for all, uh, ISSR, and so on. These are all government schemes. And there may be a few kind of private schemes that are also being offered uh, in amongst those. So are communities restricted to just choosing from one amongst them? Or is there a possibility that communities can go further and uh, ask for policies and schemes that are more attuned to what they want, not having to choose, but saying, we don't want your choices. We want something beyond that. I'm asking this question just to explore whether within the matrix that Aditya has presented, there is any space for, for this, this kind of conversation. That's the first one. The second one is of uh, incremental housing. I think Aditya has presented an excellent uh, visual, diagrammatic, and physical evidence of how people tend to build a bit at a time. And they'll build ground floor, then they'll build first floor. Maybe later on, they even be a, build a second floor. This is something that is uh, uh, quite typical. It doesn't have to be assisted housing. It doesn't have to be uh, government saying, we'll give you three lakhs. It doesn't have to be any private uh, NGO saying, we'll give you one lakh. Uh, it's how communities build houses. Uh, they take a piece of land, they'll first build a a shack, a very temporary kind of thing, some of which we saw in some of the pictures, you know, a roof made of grass thatch or a wall made of mud or made of, uh, you know, tin sheets or whatever. And then gradually over time, and we've seen this in many cities and towns, the quality of housing begins to change. Uh, suddenly, a mud wall is replaced by a brick wall. 
uh, uh, grass roof will be replaced by um, corrugated iron sheet, you know, things that are a little more permanent and that don't require maintenance. The problem with many of the traditional structures is that they require a lot of maintenance, uh, particularly during the monsoon. Um, so that is why communities tend to gradually uh, do what is called incremental housing. And this incremental housing is something that is very native to communities. So I was just wondering whether, you know, the kind of credit assistance that is provided through these housing schemes could be, could be transcended, could be, in fact, communities say we don't want credit, just give us tenure. Uh, because if you give us tenure, we will find enough saving every year to invest in that land ourselves. Uh, this is something that needs a lot of thinking about because we have seen, I think in many, many towns that people do this incremental housing regardless. They'll just invest uh, depending on how secure they feel on that land. Uh, that brings me to my third point, which is of land tenure itself. You know, what exactly is the argument for tenure on land? Is it that uh, give us houses now, give us tenure later, give us kacha pattas now to be later converted into pakka pattas? I mean, why is land such a central theme? And I think uh, one may want to draw into this uh, the whole argument of private development of land, uh, private participation in housing, and so on. Because, um, you know, 20 years ago, land was not such a significant aspect of uh, community group of, of, of towns. Land has become very significant after JNNUR because suddenly uh, towns and cities have acquired the property of commodities that here are places to invest. Here are places where rate of returns can be calculated and I'm sure you know that now all towns are listed against this viability criteria, words that are being used, viability all the time, financial viability, and so on. And this viability is an economic calculation of the city. And in fact, the only asset that cities and towns have to back up, to in a sense guarantee any kind of private investment is land. And that is why land has become so critical today. So given that criticality of land within the context of investment into towns and cities and the, the, the gradual withdrawal of state agencies from investment and saying private groups will now do this investment uh, in this whole game, where exactly does the community demand for land figure? And I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure, I don't think Aditya, or maybe you presented it earlier when I was not able to listen in, but uh, I didn't uh, hear it towards the end. As to what happened to all these plans, did the governments, did the uh, Nagarpalikas, the ULBs accept these plans? and say, okay, even if private developers don't invest, we will invest. My guess would be they didn't want to invest. And therefore they said, these plans are not going to work out. But uh, I, I seek to be enlightened on that. And therefore in the absence of an investment guarantee, what happens to these plans? Where does the land issue figure? That's my third point. And the fourth point, which I, I was personally very happy to notice about uh, what uh, Geddes long ago 
called surgical conservancy, which is that you don't convert a non-linear way of life into a linear way of life. So you kind of start straightening out all the roads, making blocks, making square houses. Uh, you don't give any space for culture, for caste, for you know how uh, communities live, for all the social dynamics. And uh, this uh, is something that I think in your plans are coming out so clearly. The only one feature I have, or one kind of uh, comment that came up that was somewhat disturbing was a certain isolationism that you separate one caste from another because of different kinds of rituals. Uh, but uh, perhaps one needs to rethink that. Uh, that surgical conservancy could also accommodate different classes and castes because that is the richness of community life. If that richness is not there, then one is likely to fall into the trap that is being laid uh, before us right now in terms of all the fundamentalist efforts that are going on, uh, particularly in Gujarat of uh, segregation and uh, Consequently, uh, a kind of a kind of non-recognition and therefore also hatred between communities, and therefore this needs rethinking. Uh, so those are my four points that are emerging from some of the very rich material that has been pro provided here by Aditya and his Vanarshala colleagues. I must uh, felicitate you, you on an excellent presentation. And uh, for my last uh, comment, which is not coming out of that presentation, because in a sense it's absent, uh, which is that this is very uh, uh, housing or shelter focused. And uh, the tragedy is, that, and as we know, and it's coming out in your maps, that what we call slums are actually labor colonies. And these labor colonies, by calling them slums, you in fact rob uh, them of identity, uh, of labor. And that labor identity is very important because they come to cities for livelihoods. They don't come for shelter. Shelter is built where they find livelihoods. And therefore, uh, incorporating the livelihood element is extremely important. One of them is the, I think has been you pointed out, which is that it has to be within, resettlement has to be within 800 meters. And that's a good sign because 800 meters is essentially what is walkable distance. So that means livelihoods are not going to be too far away and walking is, is still going to be possible. But uh, that is an, you know, a very integral component of planning. And I'm surprised I didn't see it in livelihoods because that also is related to another comment that uh, Aditya made about a lot of it has gone over to MIG housing. And that is implicit in all cities and towns because just like uh, LIG, the MIG families also don't get adequate housing because government has never built adequate housing. I mean, uh, if I look at national figures, all development authorities, all ULBs, all government housing schemes have never, never achieved more than 55% of target, which essentially means 45 has not been built. And if 45% has not been built, then that is where not only labor, but also supervisory and white collar workers uh, who comprise the bulk of MIG uh, are going to go. I mean, they'll build illegal housing and every time any kind of housing scheme comes up, MIG will very much be there to grab it because uh, they have the money to, 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 to take up many of even LIG flats or LIG plots 
which are allocated. So that is why livelihoods is a very important component. And uh, I am a little surprised that it's not there in the presentation, or maybe it was there in the part I missed, but at least the part I saw, it wasn't there. So once again, congratulations. Uh, I'm absolutely marvelous presentation. Uh, and if some of these four issues that I highlighted and the fifth component of livelihoods, uh, you know, there could be some discussion around those, then, uh, well, I think my task would be done. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kunu, for those uh, insightful comments and questions. Um, Aditya, would you like to um, start uh, maybe addressing a few of them? And in the meantime, we can also get questions from the audience. I can ask them to post them in the chat box uh, as well. Yeah, uh, so yeah, wonderful feedback from Guruji. It was uh, a delight listening to him. Uh, and uh, I think we agree with uh, uh, many of the issues and points that he just highlighted. I can start probably addressing from uh, the last to the first. Uh, for the MIG and uh, uh, that whole argument, we, when we did our surveys in these eight cities, uh, we hardly got 5% of the demand from this section when we're doing the survey. So if suppose there are uh, 2000 houses, uh, which uh, the in, in the informal settlements and uh, the housing demand that came for the other so-called urban poor was hardly 100 to 200 houses, which was actually quite surprising for us also, because initially when we began doing the study, we expected that a good number uh, uh, would come from this section, but it did not. Uh, in, in Bhuj, I think we had only 700 forms that were filled for uh, housing and there were 14,000 uh, uh, households in informal settlement. So that was the difference that was coming when we were doing the study, which was pretty interesting. Uh, it was also interesting because when the access to CLSS component, the loan system came in, that was picked up very quickly and a good number of families within Bhuj who had not been earlier interested, started getting interested in it, for which we, I think it's a point of study, further study, which we have not done, but we have been assuming the fact that a lot of it is builder developed. So it is not, uh, 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 the builder is the one that is advertising for it. And they are the ones who are pulling in the families to access, which is, which I think is not necessarily a bad thing because you still are getting housing stock in the cities for this section. But it's still debatable. We within our office also we have uh, opposing uh, views whether this money should go for MIG or not, or whether you should pool it for infrastructure and informal settlements and, and so on. So that is there, and we still we haven't figured that thing out, and probably we won't. But yeah. and yeah, the other thing about caste separation and uh, uh, isolationism, which kind of came up is because I think in Gujarat, we have struggled with it. It has, especially in informal settlements, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, facilitate something which is more, uh, you know, uh, mixed. There's already so much factionalism, so much uh, separation that it becomes difficult for, uh, uh, you know, if, if I eat within my own income, class, if I'm eating non-vegetarian, I'm not going to find a house in the city in, in any uh, or a decent house. So that is something that we, even this, in this, we kind of based that when we were talking about relocation, you know, with, whether you would like to live with this community because your uh, settlement is getting flooded and so on. So that is a challenge that I don't think we have figured it out. We did another uh, work in Ahmed Nagar in Maharashtra where we kind of figured it out where, uh, uh, but what made it possible was also because it's Maharashtra and the other thing was uh, because people there themselves were ready to mix, except for one or two communities and one of those communities was Gujarati there. So that uh, uh, was there. Uh, and of course we, we uh, 
uh, when we talk about participation in these all all of these processes, it, it's it's one of the most important things that we we, we value in all these processes. So whether uh, how much land is being demanded, or whether uh, people actually want houses, or do they want just land? And that is something that got gets reflected. And it's not a very straight answer that we get when we start talking to people through participation. So we'll have to figure that out using our own experience with the government and the rules and laws that we have understood uh, uh, per se. So, for example, in some some of the settlements, they would say, okay, you just give us uh, water supply because we have to climb down the hill, get water and come back. And rest of it we'll handle and just, uh, you know, give us security from eviction. That's all we need. Rest of it we'll do it. But in some of the pockets, we saw that they said, no, we please give us some uh, uh, housing shelter because we've been here for 25, 30 years or 50 years. And it's very difficult in heat and when it rains, so we need some shelter. And because they are earning far less than some of, and it's not a very homogeneous uh, economic strata within the informal settlements themselves. So some might be able to afford one and a half lakh per half. Some might not even give twenty thousand. So we have to understand that, and that's where the participation part comes in, where they also talk to each other, not just to us as NGOs or government, but also amongst them there has to be a conversation. We try, which we try to. Uh, facilitate and through this the incrementality also gets taken care of when we start having participatory processes uh, people themselves start speaking up but okay what happens next what if oh you're talking about g plus 2 what if i want to build further how do i build uh, and so on and that is where our facilitation work starts happening where we say okay we, are, we build this much right now next you can build like this uh, or like this, or we just provide a framework of development in these pockets, which kind of happened in a way in the first example that I talked about, where we only built the two rooms in the, the ground floor, and later on we only provided them land to expand further. And the government will say, when we go to the government, the government uh, will say, okay, you go check that they don't build further, okay? It's, it's your responsibility. If you're giving land, they will encroach. So there we say, okay, we, they won't, they won't. But we know that they will uh, build more it's not encroachment it's basically because what they want so we kind of facilitate that we say that if you are going to encroach you should do it this way and we will prepare this for you and that's what is another participatory way of taking care of this increment incrementality which we have been working with uh, yeah and the argument of land i, I don't know if uh, i will be able to like fully express that, but I think the, what we have been doing in Bhuj now is that we are preparing uh, informal uh, households to demand for land uh, and put applications to collectorate to transfer land to them uh, and telling them that this is where I've stayed for this much time, this is the area of the land that I am uh, occupying, this is the survey. Land. And uh, right now I think 800 to 1000 applications have already gone. Uh, for uh, land access. Uh, what we are hoping in future is also to again not you know, is uh, isolate these families as individual families, but also do further social mobilization yeah. and uh, processes where they start pooling this land as not something that I'm getting or someone else is getting, but together as a, 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 you know, a settlement of 100 houses, this is a land we are getting together. And now what we do, but that's a long shot right now. Uh, yeah, I think I'll I'll stop here. Thank you, Aditya. Um, are there any uh, questions, comments from the audience? Amita, would you like to come in? Since you've also been uh, deeply involved with the Jaga work in Orisha, and maybe you know you can sort of look at it from the also the land question. I'll wait for some questions and then sure. Aditya, I think you um, may not have mentioned, uh, Duno asked this, is what is currently the status of uh, the work here, meaning how much of it has actually uh, been implemented or where, where are we currently standing with this? 
Okay, uh, so because these reports did not tell the government what they wanted to hear, uh, all these reports are in dustbin right now. Uh, for most, I think all 166 cities. I think we went back just before pandemic to Gandhi to talk about it. And the officer who had actually led it was quite disappointed. He was like, we got this done. We were one of the first states to get HFPOS prepared for all the cities in the country. But right now, it's again back to the same thing. No one is actually looking at what the survey is telling them. So it's that's the status right now. And I think the focus of the program has heavily shifted to the loan uh, credit link uh, scheme to bank linkages, which is again what the government, current government is more comfortable with is centralizing things. And when credit link happens, you don't have to go to ULB or uh, 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 even state government. This gets passed through the bank directly. So it kind of bypasses that and that's where all these numbers. So it's a shortcut that you know increases the numbers. But yeah, these reports, I think uh, they have not been looked upon for, for the implementation. Even though they have been using the annual input implementation plan numbers, which were earlier prepared in these reports as uh, you know, some benchmark to push ULBs to go further with uh, uh, implementation. But not how these should be implemented, that how is not there. Uh, we have a question from Anindita. Anindita, would you like to sort of read it out? Hi, hi. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Aditya. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, two questions. One is uh, whether, uh, do you know whether the loans are actually going to EWS because the national data says less than 10% or 7% loans actually have gone to EWS. So what's the status in Gujarat, if you have any any insight and uh, so that that would mean if it is not going to ws that would mean the work that you had done earlier still holds a lot of value uh, both for the government as well as for the communities and uh Ved, i'm sorry i missed the last part of your presentation was there in situ slum redevelopment using land as a resource under that vert vertical was there any project from these small cities i'll be very uh, interested to know. Uh, uh, can you repeat the, the second part of the question? I think there's some location. No, so uh, could you, uh, uh, you can hear me right. Yes. Uh, now, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm asking, was there any in-situ slum redevelopment uh, using land as a resource kind of happened in Gujarat in these cities? Because as part of HFAPA, I saw that there were certain slums where you actually found the additional land available. So was any private sector interested in uh, doing any in-situ ISSR as they call it? Uh, so the first part of the question, the loans that are, uh, uh, banks are reluctant to give loans to people who cannot show, uh, you know, recovery possibilities. Uh, and so it's mostly people who are showing that, okay, we have something to go for and, you know, uh, uh, they are getting their loans. It's not just in Gujarat, even in Ahmednagar, we were, when we are working, the first thing is that bank won't give you a loan, which is less than one lakh, uh, because uh, they, they are mandated wow. to give something more than that. And we could not secure ro uh, loans for these families even in Ahmednagar because banks just refused. They said that unless you give them uh, what will we recover if they're uh, not going to return the money. What is it that we have? Uh, in Ramdevnagar in Bhuj, when we were doing it under RAY, they, uh, even then we had a problem. But because there was a promise of land to these families, some loans were given out. But now the AWS sector, uh, wherever we have worked, we have not done a full study on what is happening throughout the state, but uh, wherever we have worked, it's very difficult for an AWS family to get loans under the scheme. Uh, uh, because simply they don't have to, they, they can't show something which can be recovered in return if they're not paying the loans back. Uh, so that was one. And the second is in C2 that uh, uh, you asked, we, uh, we are not aware if that has happened. Uh, under ISSR, uh, 
So maybe in, in bigger cities where we have not worked, it might have happened. Uh, I, I have seen uh, in, in Gandhi Nagar, uh, they, have, uh, they have several presentations where in Rajkot, Surat, they have done it. Uh, but uh, yeah. we are not aware of it. Person, uh, person. No, I was intrigued to know if uh, a small city has also gone for it. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, and, and that's because the developers or builders are not ready. In all these eight cities that we studied, even when uh, we were doing it in 2016 and 18, we were, first of all, there are no such developers in these cities. So the scheme doesn't know that in smaller towns you don't have such developers who develop and earn money and then sell because there's no one to. Uh, rates are pretty low and then when we went to the uh, state government telling them that they, they said you go for smaller contractors if they can do it or not and consider them as developers but none of these contractors were ready why would they uh, you know because the profit margins are so low so that was another reason uh, yeah. right thanks thanks so much Thank you. There's a conversation, Aditya, in the chat box going on uh, with Malini's question. Malini, do you want to pose the question here? Sure, sure. Just, uh, you know, I was just ref reflecting on this, um, uh, this issue of, uh, you know, given the fact that um, your case tells us that, you know, uh, in the smaller towns in Gujarat, there is land. And, and a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the informal housing is actually located on public uh, lands, yet it is not, I mean, there is an unwillingness to set it aside for housing. Um, though if you ask these cities, you know, what is the need, what are these lands being set aside for? I don't think that there would be answers. I mean, it's not as if they, they own these lands, but there is no, no long-term, no short-term real, uh, real use even being thought of and yet there's an unwillingness like in your case you showed that there could be a possibility to actually house all of these people and yet that was not happening so my my i mean i was just wondering you know uh, except maybe uh, in the mumbai 1964 dp and a few early plans you know you see some amount of uh, the, some kind of uh, uh, land being set aside for public housing and uh, after that in the in the uh, even though there are significant uh, sections of our population that don't have access to property, don't have access to land, you don't have uh, development plans putting aside land for housing. Um, and uh, as in the case of Gujarat, even when there's land, uh, public land, it's not being put aside for housing. Delhi, uh, another classic case, land is owned by the state, but you know, you're not willing to give it up for housing. So. So in this situation, what do you see as the way forward, both for Gujarat and in general? You know, I was just wondering. Hmm. Uh, before you ask, Aditya, I think Amita has also made a point to Madhini about this, and maybe you want to add that, Amita, before Aditya answers. Aditya is welcome to answer. But I was really coming from the more recent experiences uh, which are not linked to reservation in the development plan. But I think the willingness, at least in response to PMAY or in the backdrop of that, for whatever contingent, political, whatever reasons. But I still think that uh, Odisha or Punjab, or for that matter, Arunachal Pradesh, are certainly showing some way forward by uh, at least giving land rights to people who are staying in slums. Uh, it's, it's, it may be a limited version of a land right. There are multiple issues contained within that. But when that gets linked, I think the BLCC component is saying a very, very big update. Uh, I think similar is also the experience in Madhya Pradesh where uh, the Patta Act has been really not used well at all, especially in recent years. It has been highly diluted, but still the uptake is most in terms of BLCC. And uh, I see very, very curiously in Gujarat, and I think your presentation really brings it out so well, that uh, 
I, I think you use this Jeffrey Payne uh, framework where one is looking at the curative and one is looking at the preventive, which is really important. If the curative part is really taking care of existing informal settlements, then giving land titles or security to those settlements is so very critical. And one really does not see that forthcoming from the more urbanized states, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, Odisha taking the lead here. Uh, Punjab, in some ways, I would say much a diluted form, but still uh, showing some way uh, forward. Arunachal Pradesh definitely shows some way forward. Uh, but Gujarat reluctance is something which really needs to be in some ways broken down. <laughs> yes, Aditya, would you like to yeah. sort of reflect on this? Yeah, so I think, uh, yes, that's yeah. where uh, we are, yeah, at least in Bhuj and smaller cities in Kutch, but that's where we are headed. We are kind of trying to move a, a social movement for access to land which and showing the examples of say Punjab or Odisha to you know to work with the government but there's like what Amitaji said there's a very strong reluctance uh, both in bureaucracy and political class to hand over the land and even in smaller cities like Bhuj even if we ask for land for you know very temporary shelters for say migrant workers the government is not ready to give it. Uh, even though there's the land credit and even though there are no other contestants because they are reserving it for infrastructure, speculative infrastructure and uh, uh, structures that might come later on where the bigger players might get interested and would then become you know, a money-making initiative for everyone. So that's a, that's a big problem that we are facing here. Uh, and uh, uh, I think one of the ways that we want to, and I think Amitaji is also guiding us with that, is through uh, social movement, through uh, civil society organizations and all that. Uh, they start demanding this land. At least there's a movement that is created where something starts coming in. So at least it might be a very long uh, uh, path that we will have to cover, but somewhere we start at, you know, demanding that land. And it is not just housing, even, even for street vendors, even for migrant workers, where is the land in the city? And that's what uh, we, are, we have started to work on uh, because we realize that unless there's a, a public demand, just organizations may not be able to advocate this with the government, which we have been trying to do and failing. So that's the uh, status of that. Okay. Um, I'd like to take Simran's question now. Simran, would you like to ask uh, Speak about your question. Speak it yes, up. Yes, thank, thank you, ma'am. Hi, Aditya. Thank you for your presentation. Um, having worked on PMAY in certain capacity, I could really resonate with the challenges and things that you were posing. And one thing I wanted to bring up was also about how, um, let's say, once the project has been built and family has has to be accommodated into uh, these PMAY houses, how does then uh, how can the NGOs, the CSO, then play a crucial role in um, supporting the families to eventually shift? Um, this is also a point sort of connecting with what you had ju just pointed out a while ago. And in my experience of having visited Gujarat, I uh, saw how Mahila Housing Trust has really been crucial in giving such support in around 23 cities of Gujarat. But um, we see that for other states, CSOs don't really um, have that opportunity or that space to get involved in PMAY that actively, um, especially in terms of social audit and um, helping the community to settle in a new place. So any thoughts on that? How do you think that can be improved? Something more for Gujarat or other states? Uh, uh, I think CSOs have to play a very important role in facilitating this, and like we have been doing in Bhujal. So we have several organizations here working on different aspects. And we here, at least in Bhuj, what we've realized that uh, it cannot be just one specific sector that you can target. You'll have to work holistically. 
So you'll have to work on women's issues, which gets connected to housing issue and, and so on. And uh, uh, that way, what we generally do is we have several local partners who go out there, who work on this, who mobilize the communities uh, for this and also empower them to start taking their own course uh, uh, on this. And uh, yeah, like I said earlier also, even here when we are doing land, uh, you know, a demand for land coming in from informal sector, that is being done through CSO and other civil-based uh, uh, organizations. So there's one more question. Uh, Rohit, uh, would you like to place your question? I think he's asking about the need for a differentiated approach and how do you sort of look at that? Yeah, uh, yeah so thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, so yeah, great presentation, Aditya, again, like brings a lot of stimulation and sort of understand, I wanted to understand about uh, how to kind of uh, decide in which direction to kind of uh, advocate fight when it comes to tenure security in in the larger cities of course like uh, the land availability is as it is limited and uh, fighting for land is itself a very complex phenomenon and then there is a layer of housing security because you can only uh, own a percentage or a small share of land since it's a vertical sort of a development so like a couple of uh, uh, options. In fact, I was also talking about uh, 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 so like one of the ways to fight is then recognizing the existing by focusing on uh, upgradation or a retrofitting sort of an approach, an incremental approach towards uh, building tenure security. So these are like just some of the initial thoughts. Uh, so any, any of your learnings when it comes to uh, like cross learning from smaller cities into the larger urban areas when it comes to tenure security? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you're right, Rohit. The, the challenges in bigger cities are very different than in these smaller towns. And the pressure on land is a, a lot. Like what Donuji also pointed out, the, the commodification of land has created a lot of problems uh, here. And what we, what we did uh, in Ahmednagar in Maharashtra was kind of jumped into a middle-sized town and tried to apply the learnings that we had from these smaller towns in this uh, settlement and uh, what we what we so there were two ways that we could have uh, gone further with one is that we demand land for these families in that uh, pocket uh, the same amount of land that they held at the moment and then work on the infrastructure and the other one was what we did in Burj but a little modified to suit the higher densities without uh, uh, breaking the social capital that they already had uh, finally we went with the second part uh, and it was, I think, in, in about 1.8 acres, there were 300 uh, families, 300 to 350 families. Uh, and so uh, we worked with them. Uh, we kind of created these smaller clusters. Instead of giving individual you know, uh, land holding or land tenure, we created six or seven different clusters and they got uh, uh, you know, uh, collective land holding or, or not land holding, but collective ownership of the property that would be developed. So created these commons uh, in, in, in different sizes, different patterns and create, and then formed uh, some, uh, some sort of RWA under the Societies Act, which then became, got the right of using this space or they may not have the ownership uh, per se legally or documents, but they had the right of deciding how it is to be used and which kind of changed the way uh, we approached in those. So these are multi uh, floor, I think three or four floors mix uh, uh, developments instead of the ground floor uh, development that we were doing in Bridge, but uh, owned by a certain uh, number of families. Uh, and they were the ones who were deciding what are the bylaws for this, how the terrace is going to be used, how the internal connections are allowed, how the cluster, the courtyard, who's going to use it, when is when are they going to use it, and so on. So that I think kind of not, we could not get the land ownership, but certain different degree of ownership that uh, got implemented or is now under implementation that happened. So Aditya, I'd like to also go back and uh, 
uh, while we were doing some work on looking at uh, BSUP housing in Odisha, I seem to recall that some of the, the clusters within the city, um, they were re these occupational groups who used land uh, for say pottery, you know, common lands, not exactly at the housing level, but uh, you know, two, three houses may have some common space for uh, drying, baking, making the pottery, et cetera, or even cow sheds, uh, stuff like that. So I'm just wondering, you know, so there is that, of course, that livelihood mm -hmm. aspect, which BSUP absolutely did not uh, take into account at that point and sort of, you know, left hanging midway. So I'm wondering if uh, during the kind of participation that you had or in discussing with people, did these kinds of um, livelihood approaches come into the way uh, you discussed? Because you definitely talked about the social dynamics, but I'm wondering whether, you know, some of these livelihood approaches um, in small towns were addressed in the design. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, that livelihood is one of the most uh, important aspects that we look at when we are working because like what Dunuji said, these are labor colonies. That's how they are there. That, that's the, one of the most essential threads that connects all these families, not just with each other, but to that piece of land. And uh, we generally uh, work with this livelihood as a strength of that community. So for, for uh, Ramdev Nagar, they, uh, most of them were construction workers, but they were interested in also producing blocks of them uh, by themselves. So how do we incorporate that? How do we decide the commons for uh, this settlement where they together decide, okay, this much area we'll reserve uh, for this. So not just that the whole uh, settlement is divided into just what is, you know, mandatory 5% open for personal properties, but they started giving this, uh, these common spaces. The same thing we did uh, in Ahmednagar where there's a Sikh Juni community, which are fab who are fabricators. But right now they work on mostly work on daily wage on other fabricators. But they showed interest in uh, you know uh, establishing their own fabrication uh, shared in this settlement once that is developed. So we then designed the cluster for that and then asked them to develop bylaws for on how they do this uh, activity there. So the other thing now it's not just on the settlement, but we realized that. Outside the settlement also, of course, there's a lot of livelihood uh, opportunities that they pursue. So we started working with street vendors because in, in uh, many of these settlements where people were involved in street vending. So that kind of opened up a very different front for us where we started working on streets, started accessing uh, 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 very, various legal measures that allows them to do business and how do we implement that. So then that becomes another faction that, that gets attached to the work that we've been doing in these small cities. So that's kind of uh, really fascinating in the way, you know, uh, the, the commons are being defined as you go along, but it seems that there's a tension there uh, because, it, you know, the, the scheme sort of promotes this centralization, the financialization of the land passes specific to the housing unit. But here the concept is, you know, if you, if you have this bottom-up driven approach, people are more cognizant of the other things that come with the housing. It's not just my house, my property, but it's also housing as a social sort of, you know, space uh, for families to grow, for social relations, for dynamics, for livelihoods, and also the, the sense of community. So it stretches and expands beyond just the housing unit, which I think the financialization tries to do is kind of, you know, uh, sort of firmly sort of concretely tied to the housing unit. Uh, and created more in terms of commodity and not in terms of uh, a, a kind of a social sort of gain to make uh, as an asset, as you'd see a social asset in the long run. So in, in doing this, I'm just wondering about the kind of governance uh, dynamics that you might have faced, uh, you know, organizations or institutions that have come forward or maybe certain champions within the government uh, and at what scale uh, did you face challenges, but at what scales and at what places did you also find people uh, willing to open up and engage in this discussion uh, and, and sort of move it forward? Because clearly there are complex rules, regulations that you were dealing with, uh, not just at building uh, level, but at planning regulations, uh, livelihood issues. So I'm just curious as to 
who were the players in that you were sort of working with and how did you sort of negotiate this? Yeah, uh, so uh, we, I, I can give you a very nice example. When uh, in Ramdev Nagar, after developing, after like, uh, you know, yes, utilizing the social capital itself to, uh, you know, uh, promote this owner-driven community-led approach, we went back and there's, uh, uh, and we had their uh, women's group, uh, which was also leading many of the social organization activities. And one of the leaders, Hansa Ben, I asked her that, Are, abhi to ho gaya hai, no? now we have good house, everything. And she's like, ah, everything is good. But we were, I feel, more close earlier with each other than what we are now. And now we are, now because we have got this land tenure, uh, we, are, we have been building boundaries, now, which we didn't earlier. Uh, even though, even in the initial part of the development, they were, they did not build it, but as soon as uh, one small fight happens, they're like, this is my land and I want to build a boundary. No, I don't want to do anything with you. So what, again, what Dunuji was saying that isolationism is not just at different caste or community level, but after the, uh, within the communities itself starts happening, but not necessarily in a bad way as you know one may imagine uh, because they are exercising their right on that land which is good but the gov that's where the governance system becomes very important uh, uh, you know when we form these uh, informal settlement societies with you know 50% women 50% men the leaders are there they start deciding who purchases material where so that governance system kind of comes in and starts uh, uh, playing a role of managing the commons uh, the so same with Ahmed Nagar. All these, uh, there are seven uh, different uh, groups who are leading this cluster, uh, uh, these clusters in construction and deciding the bylaws. But they, all of them have representatives in a central group also who decides those parcels which are not part of these clusters. How do you uh, work on that? How do you manage that? So I think more than design, the governance system becomes a very important part on how do you work with the commons and strengthen instead of you know, uh, weakening that fabric. So I think Malini has posted an example uh, from uh, Kerala. Uh, Malini, do you want to sort of talk about that a little bit more? Um, I actually don't know a lot, except that, you know, it was this big announcement that was done by the local self-government uh, uh, minister. And uh, I mean, I, I was there for some, some other... Just, I had no idea that he was going to make some um, announcement like this. But anyway, it, it was, uh, I was there for some something else. And he then actually launched this campaign. And then they were also, um, uh, they said that uh, basically they're inviting uh, Kerala being so dense. They were saying that we have a lot of people who have extra land. And uh, if, if they can come ahead and, you know, show um, some, as an example, I mean, actually, um, there was Adur Gopal Krishnan, the well-known filmmaker who had actually donated not a lot of land, but like 13 cents, like a cent is 440 uh, square foot. So he had made this donation. He was being held up as an example. And then they actually in this one district with the minister was in, in Palakkad, there were a lot of large landowners who were then being felicitated because they had given up land uh, that they had a few acres. There was somebody who had given a few hectares and they were all being felicitated that day by the uh, minister and I thought that was kind of interesting because I had not heard um, any discussion on this before even though we were talking about housing and all of that and this came as a big surprise in fact I almost forgot and I uh, uh, you know when because of this discussion I thought it would be <laughs> pertinent that there's this kind of campaign that is now ongoing in Kerala yeah, interesting Seems like urban Bhudan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, Bhudan, now suddenly there's this whole uh, uh, thing, but a lot of people seem to think, well, why not? And and I, I mean, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I think it's also interesting that uh, Gujarat has kind of taken the lead when it comes to town planning schemes as being one of the you know, suspect, successful kind of schemes, but clearly it works only when you have uh, clear property ownership and legal sort of claims to land. Um, 
in a way, what you're suggesting here is, is uh, pooling off land, but it's much more voluntary and uh, there's a sense of people creating commons and uh, and out of that also giving back uh, to communities or for other kinds of future use. Um, so it's not something that, you know, the, the government sort of trying to impose a town planning scheme onto a particular place, but the other way around of people trying to sort of build uh, a sort of more habitable, inclusive kind of community uh, by pooling in. Uh, how did you get to this point? Is is there something that you know uh, through discussions, or you know, did, did this happen naturally, or you know, where where did this idea sort of come about, and how did it kind of take shape? Uh, uh, you're asking about the land pooling and managing the commons, right? Eh? Yes. Uh, so uh, the communities do it. They have been doing it traditionally. The the understanding of commons is very strong. Unlike uh, uh, us staying in uh, separate apartments and so on, uh, so we didn't have to do much effort in there. We we had to just ask them to you know uh, do what they have been doing uh, uh, and so on. Uh, TP scheme also kind of I don't know post earthquake I think various TP schemes were done even for Bhuj. Uh, and people voluntarily gave away land for development. So I think there is an understanding what even uh, uh, Malini touched upon that uh, they, people are ready for giving away land for better infrastructure in, in MIG and LIG group also, or even in EWS, they understand the, the, the importance of commons. So that kind of happened naturally and people understood it very uh, you know they, they understood it readily that okay this is good uh, not just land wise but also like again i'll go back to amnagar because it's a very different example where people instead of uh, you might know that when when a builder develops an apartment the circulation area is kept as minimum as possible because it's not saleable right it's a, a, on, the houses are sold and super built up area, people like, okay, what is the property? I'm not interested in super built up area. But in Ahmednagar, people wanted extra large corridors where they could sit, work, interact with people. They wanted connections between different buildings. And they said, okay, okay it's okay. We, it's a commons. So we are ready to like pay, for, you know, because they were also uh, told that you might have to contribute something. They, they readily accepted, say, a slightly lesser carpet area but a larger corridor area where they could use it, uh, you know, under commons. So we kind of worked with them and they, they also understood it uh, with this. But I think the social fabric that is there in informal sector, in, in settlements, they understand the idea of commons because that is what gives them the foothold in the city at the first place. When, when a migrant worker comes and talks to his brother or her aunt and says that I have to come and work, they get them there in that they understand what the commons is uh, but the problem is the government kind of segregates that they are they are interested in numbers in isolated numbers because it's easier to govern right so uh, which is where i think in these cities we had recommended and the pilot also that we did in, in Burj or in Ahmedabad is to facilitate this uh, this conversation with the government agencies convincing them instead of the people why this will be beneficial for this work uh, thank you so much, uh, Aditya and Dunu. I'm going to request Amita to uh, say a few words of thanks and wrap up today's discussion. Amita. Uh, so firstly, I think, thanks, Aditya. Uh, and I think uh, there are two levels at which I see these discussions. One was a level of discussion which is definitely about participation, designing, uh, thinking about comments, what are the kind of housing strategies. Uh, but I think more critical for me was the entire conversation actually about what is being, that is the land, and which links and integrates several of the concerns that Tinu talked about. Uh, they are concerns about commons, they are concerns about larger claims, these are concerns about larger stakes to the city. These are concerns about uh, security that stretch beyond generations uh, in some ways. 
uh, and these are also concerns about uh, not just housing but also livelihoods. Uh, and I think the uh, your your presentation at that level uh, brought about several of the discomforts that you are uh, experiencing as an organization and as the kind of efforts that you are talking about. The uh, I want to just place here on record that if you look at the PMAY performance in Gujarat, it is not a bad performance at all. In fact, it seems to be the, uh, not the top most, but the second to top most performance in the entire country, especially when looked at from financial point of view, 95% of the uh, money seems to have been spent is what the claims are okay and that's what makes it one of the top performance but the, here is where the precise point of concern starts right if the issues of slums are not being addressed existing informal settlements in cities okay so neither does dlcc seem to reach them basically because no land rights have been given and therefore they, they cannot implement dlcc and issr is financially non-viable in many of these small towns then what one understands is basically that the pmay is proceeding ahead while leaving these people in informal settlements far behind Okay. And I think this is something that all of us need to worry about. Not that it's not about inclusion in a particular scheme that one is really talking about, but it is actually about what does it portend in the future. Okay. Does this mean that these people are also going to be further disenfranchised from their claims to the 6%, 4% lands that they have been uh, uh, claiming stakes to or have been occupying in different ways. And I think, therefore, these struggles to even maintain those kind of lands, perhaps I think that is also the basis what prompts a developmental organization like Hunar Shala to even think about, uh, I would say, propelling some kind of social triggers towards demanding land. And uh, I think, therefore, that becomes a essential uh, preclude uh, to a social movement as other people do. Uh, I do not know whether this really sounds the success of these kind of movements. But I think that definitely what your presentation suggests, indicates, and propels us is to reiterate once again the importance of access to land as something which underlies uh, several housing interventions. Uh, with this, I would like to not only thank Aditya for the wonderful, very thoughtful presentation, but also Dunu uh, for his insightful comments and for agreeing so promptly to be the discussion. Uh, to all the participants uh, who have asked and uh, not only and been really a live discussion in many ways, uh, and for Aditya also responding to those questions patiently and comments as well. Uh, for Ratula, for organizing, introducing, I know there is a lot of uh, logistics that she had to organize because we were short of. Uh, Personal. So she has been compensating for that lack of hands. So wish more hands to her <laughs> because you have to go on. Uh, and all my colleagues at the Center for Urban Policy and Governance uh, for uh, one more, I would say, a great event. Uh, I would stop here. Thank you, all of you. And hope that you see and the Facebook page as well, log into future events that are also organized, not just under this Omidyar city, but also otherwise. Thank you.